warning in advance, I talk really fast. So if I start getting too fast, yell from the back, too fast. As I get more excited about stuff, I talk faster. So just be ready. Uh, so my background is, um, unlike the slide that Sherry just put up that showed what happens in a hotel in Singapore is, I come from a casino background. So uh, originally, I was a hotel, traditionalist. Um, so my mind's kind of schizophrenic. It'll flip back and forth between the two because some of the stuff I'm going to talk about will make more sense to the people in the room that aren't casino-based. And the people that are casino-based, some of it will make sense to them. I'm going to try and tie it together. So um, I'm coming out of what we call an integrated resort city in Macau. We have just under 10,000 rooms. Um, we have five casinos. We have a million square feet, uh, a million square feet of meeting space, uh, 600 retail outlets, uh, 400, or sorry, 100 uh, F&B concessionaires, either internal or external. So we kind of always are looking at what uh, our customers trying to buy. So, but I'll come back to Sherry's slide for just a second. And she talked about rooms being 80% of the profit inside a traditional hotel. In the casino environment, it's not quite the same. A room is a vehicle to bring someone in that's going to gamble, and they bring in, <laughs> can I use a hell of a lot more money on the casino side than we can ever get? But what we start to do is we start to analyze data, really looking at what is a customer buying? And there's many different things in an integrated resort that can be bought. So we've got guest rooms, we've got food and beverage, of course we've got the conventions. Um, in our case, we've also got um, transportation. We own our own ferry company. We bring people over from Hong Kong on the ferry. The ferry is a vehicle to bring people over to go into the casino <coughs> and gamble. Uh, we have buses that bring people all around the city and they're a vehicle to bring people in <laughs> work in the casino. So all of it really relates to um, getting people in and trying to get the casino optimized. So each one of these things has really a different profit profile. So we start to look at our data and then we break it down and we look at sort of what do each one of the different segments that we bring in actually materialize. And these numbers are somewhat fabricated but they're somewhat accurate. It'll give you an idea of what does a group room mean to us. Uh, you can see um, and the one that really is the most important is, as you're coming along, casino goes from 10 to 15 to 20 to 60 percent. And you can sort of see where our focus is probably going to be. But each one of them, there's a different profit profile, there is a different um, spend, <coughs> also depending on where the customer is coming from. So if we have someone that comes in out of Thailand in a wholesale environment, they're going to spend somewhat different than someone that comes in out of Shanghai. And we have databases that are really, really, really strong on the casino side. And then we have the same databases that you guys are working with on the non-gaming elements, uh, generally Opera, or we used to be LMS, so there's a few other databases that are out there. And we use it to try and extract as much data. And we also then deal with a huge enough database to get uh, statistical validity. So we're talking, on average, a million plus rooms uh, so when I draw the data and I'm down to 30,000 rooms that have been purchased out of Thailand, I can get a pretty good idea what the Thai people are going to be spending depending on the segment that they're coming in. So I flip to the next, and this is where I start to get a little bit, this is me actually moving finally. I start getting a little bit schizophrenic because I was not going to put corporate first because the number of corporate rooms that we have over the period of the year is under four digits and across, like I said, millions and millions of rooms are sold. But it was what was the most important thing to me when I was actually in a corporate environment. I worked with Hilton, I worked with Langham, and most of the time we were looking at how do we assess these types of business? And we'd look at what do we want to go into when we're dealing with a corporate account? And in many cases, um, Macau is a leisure market, so we're weekend focused. Friday, Saturday, Sunday are the busiest days, but when you get into a corporate hotel, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are the busiest days. So you tend to have sort of a flip of what we're looking for on either side. If I'm looking at the corporate accounts, of course, you always look at the number of rooms that are coming in. But you really want to look at what is the pattern. Um, I was working in Tokyo, and we used to give better discounts to the ones that showed up on the weekends as well. So the Americans that flew out on Saturday night and then stayed Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday were better for us than the ones that actually came in on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So again, the pattern then becomes important. You want to touch the weekends whenever you're on a corporate account, but you don't really want to touch them when you're on a leisure-based business. F&B, you can generally get that kind of data out of our opera system using, <coughs> we use vision on the back end to try and draw. 
We want to load it into SAST. Where's Kelly? Where's Kelly Love Thank SAST? You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then it's, of course, analyzed by your idea system at some point. Uh, <laughs> not that I'm putting a sales pitch out there because Patrick will kill me as well. <laughs> so, uh, and then we start to look at what events are they going to have. So if you're dealing with IBM, IBM had three events each year in Tokyo. We had a chance of capturing that. So again, you'd be doing more with IBM because other events are going to be. Ancillary revenues that were generated are also spa-based. Uh, transport do they use? Um, do they use Wi-Fi, which is pretty well dead everywhere in the world? There are still a few countries where they still charge for it. And then for us, in the casino. So in some cases, you'd actually be able to track by individual. Um, it does sound strange, but if anyone's ever gone to a casino and got that little rewards card, you are tracked. Uh, <laughs> so if we can then correlate, these are the 15 names that come in from the company, and these are the cards that they use, I can get an idea of what your company then does spend on an individual basis. Um, in some cases, when we start to get into wholesale and things, we might just look at a region. So it might just be a geographical area. So for us now, wholesale, um, I'm now going to flip again to the casino <laughs> model, and I'm all about weekends. And at this point in time, I'm now not wanting to get people coming in on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm now trying to get people coming in Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So how many rooms a year, and what is their seasonality? Uh, we look at uh, uh, which markets uh, want things in their rates. Uh, India, for us, usually flies into Hong Kong. You spend once, two years on ferries, come over to our <coughs> hotels, you're spending and gamble, but they always come in on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday pattern. So we tend to do more things with India, tends to be a very strong target market for us. China, on the other hand, can walk across the border, so they don't need ferry. Day of the week pattern, weekend versus weekday. And then again, when I'm looking at a wholesale account and I'm picking up a new uh, account out of Malaysia, I'm going to go into the database and I'm going to look at what is the propensity of Malaysia to gamble, and then I'll play it against what are the rates that we're looking at for the year. Groups, and I don't want to steal from you, Terran Dip. I, I <laughs> at one point in time, we didn't have groups, so I put a bit of group in. Uh, for us, we took a model out of Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, uh, our property in Las Vegas does, I don't even know, 70% group rooms? They do a million plus group rooms a year. It's a 7,000 room hotel. And they start the year with about 750,000 rooms on the books for the year. They finish at 1.1 million. We are not anywhere near those numbers. But we took a model from them. And it was more about trying to figure out if I give out too much space, if I give away too many meeting rooms, can I still get the number of rooms that I need in to actually hit my quotas? <coughs> it's almost backwards to the way a traditional hotel would look at it. Because in most cases, you have lots of meeting space. And you're trying to optimize <coughs> and trying to use as much as you can. But this is, comes from a hotel model where there isn't enough meeting space, even though it is a million plus square feet. So everything really started to look at what are the patterns of the room usage. And we used to call it a space group ratio. And at 110 square meters, if you were too much space, you would be called a space cake. And we would do everything in our power to try and bring down the number of meeting space meters that you were using. But when we're looking into group inquiries, again, same day of the week pattern for us. We all want them during the week. I only want them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday possibly. I don't really want them to touch the weekend. If they're going to touch the weekend, I'm going into huge displacement, so I tend to try and avoid that. Um, how big is the discounts on room rates? Uh, we also have another kind of strange model inside of our company, which is there is nothing that's really free. So if the casino gives away a room, the casino marketing department pays the hotel for the room. If Brian gives away breakfast on a group, Brian's room rates pays for the breakfast. If Brian gives away a ferry, Brian pays for the ferry. So everything is always paid for. There's a, a, a counter marketing account that really covers <coughs> everything. So you've got these huge expenses then because you're paying for thousands and thousands of rooms or breakfasts, or, and it's constantly moved back and forth. It starts as revenues, ends as expenses, and this is the way the model works inside the casino world. So when we start to talk about what are the things that are being given away in concessions, it's all about um, what does rooms need to pay for into these other departments to make sure that this business can actually come in. 
Um, for us, we generally work at about a 10% concession on room rates. We work at about a 5% concession on overall, um, but that is a 15% reduction out of the rooms area. And then in the end, this one is really important to us. It's the casino one. And we look at this as uh, prime dates, and prime dates for us are Chinese New Year, Labor Day, uh, Chinese National Day, um, and a few other Chinese holidays <laughs> throughout the year. <laughs> for some reason, the Chinese love to gamble. And they're good at it. Uh, day of the week pattern. So there's price points generally that are charged out to the casino, and we use pretty flat rates. We use a weekday rate, we use a weekend rate, but then each person that's coming in needs to gamble enough to create something that's called reinvestment, where we don't want to reinvest more than a certain percentage based on what they're going to gamble. So hypothetically, it could be <coughs> 20%. So we would spend $200 on a room for them if they were going to gamble 1,000 US dollars. If, and that's a hypothetical, because <laughs> I can't give you real information. So we deal with five different teams on the casino side. Some of them are very high, high-end gamblers. Some of them are very low, low-end gamblers. And you're constantly looking at which one of them is going to bring in the right number of rooms. So profit by team, uh, there's sort of a rule of doubling in profits in the casino. Um, if you look at the very, very high-end, it would seem like they would be the most profitable. But generally, they are the least profitable by percentage. So they might only bring in 5% profit, even though they gambled huge dollars. The next one would bring in 10%. The next one would bring in 20%. The next one would bring in 40%. 40% of the people that kind of walk <coughs> across the gaming floor, there aren't a lot of costs associated with them. They pull their $200 out of their wallet. They gamble. Monic loves them. Sonny loves them. I love them. Huge, huge percentage profit, but not necessarily huge profit overall. You still probably make more on the 5% than you do on the 40%. So each team, different profit levels, different percentages, and then what do we expect them to actually gamble on? So when we're looking then at each piece of business, we're looking not really just at, oh, I'm gonna come back one. We're not just looking at, is it going to bring in room revenue? Because for us, it's really not about maximizing room revenue. It's more about maximizing what we're bringing in the resort. And we're doing a lot of manipulating of the mix, and I know Stefan talked about that as sort of a basic 101 that needs to be done. Um, but we could be doing mix changes in a massive scale, in that you might end up with um, wholesale accounts going one year from 20%, to the next year being 40%, to the next year being back down to 30%, um, by simply controlling the light switches, because the wholesale isn't bringing in as much as they need on the gaming floor as something like Hoops. So, what I really wanted to emphasize is make sure you can figure out what data you have, start mining it, start looking for patterns. There will be patterns. It'll probably take you guys a bit longer because we can create enough data in about three or four days to find a pattern. Uh, it'll take you guys maybe a month or two months, but there are definitely patterns on what everyone is doing. So go out and see what you can find on your data. And that's, I'm handing over now to Karen Duke.